lovers and welcome to 21 Conversations, the 2021 Greensboro Bound Literary Festival. I'm Brian Lampkin, one of the organizers of Greensboro Bound and a co-owner of Scuppernong Books. Greensboro Bound is so excited to present to you these 21 Conversations, our effort to create something unique and special for our community within the confines of our continued virtual environment. 21 Conversations pays homage to North Carolina's rich literary history while broadening our tent to welcome in voices from outside of our own microcosm of experience. This featured presentation is but a taste of the 52 authors that we have gathered together in a series of delightful, sometimes unexpected, but always edifying conversations. Since our inception, Greensboro Bound has been committed to providing programs just like the one you're about to watch, 100% free to our community. In order to do that, we need the financial support, both big and small, of readers just like you. Please support Greensboro Bound by giving now. The text to give phone number as well as our website are on your screen. A sustaining gift of just $15 a month or the cost of a single children's book will help us remain financially solvent throughout the year. I also want to take a moment to thank our sustaining supporters, without whom Greensboro Bound would just not be possible. Our utmost gratitude to the Edward M. Armfield Senior Foundation, the Ruth Lands Memorial Fund, and Arts Greensboro for their continued belief in our vision to bring together readers and writers of all genres, ages, ethnicities, identities, and voices to foster an understanding of writing as a process that allows free expression, deepens critical thought, and helps sustain a culture of inquiry and delight that is open to all. Thank you again for joining us for the 2021 Greensboro Bound Literary Festival. Please enjoy the conversation. Hello everyone and welcome to Greensboro Bound 2021 Literary Festival. I'm Sinal Barnes, author of Monsoon Mansion, a memoir, and Malaya Essays on Freedom, and the ed editor of today's featured book, a New York Times new and noteworthy title, A Measure of Belonging, 21 Writers of Color on the New American South. I'm joined today by two contributing essays to the anthology. I have the pleasure of reuniting with these collaborators whom I've enjoyed working with and getting to know. And I'm glad that our audience can virtually meet you both tonight, Diana and Ivelisse. And it's my pleasure to introduce you both to the crowd. Diana Sehas is a pediatric neuro neurologist and writer in Durham, North Carolina. Her essays and opinion pieces have appeared in medical publications including the Journal of the American Medical Association of Neurology. Works of creative nonfiction and short stories have appeared or are forthcoming in Catapult, Passages North, The Dead Mule, School of Southern Literature, and others. Ivelisse Rodriguez's short story collection, Love War Stories, is a 2019 Penn Faulkner finalist and a 2018 Forward Reviews Indies finalist. She has published fiction in the Boston Review, All About Skin, Short Fiction by Women of Color, Obsidian, Kuwaili, The Bilingual Review, Asterisk, and other publications. She was a senior fiction editor at Kuwaili and is a Camellia Fellow and Avona Voices alum, like myself. She earned an MFA in creative writing from Emerson College and a PhD in English creative writing from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Diana and Ivelisse, pleasure to have you here. And it's been two years since I wrapped up the final drafts of Essays for a Measure of Belonging and one year since the world went into lockdown. Mm -hmm. So I hope you're both well today. How are you two doing? Okay. <laughs> yes. Good to be here though. Yes, we're, we're all here. Yes. 
Well, um, you both wrote about living in North Carolina in your essays for A Measure of Belonging. Can you tell our audience, especially those who might have not had a chance to read the book, a little bit about your connection to the state and how you might have found yourself in North Carolina at the writing of your essays? Um, Eva D, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. Um, so I actually, I guess, was having a midlife crisis and I lived in New Jersey and I was teaching in New York City and my mom and her husband were moving down to North Carolina. So I thought, oh, I'll just go freeload. And, um, and I quit my job and I was going to work on my novel down here. And, um, but she wanted to stay here. So um, we ended up buying a house together. Um, so the essay I wrote was when we first got here and we were living in Clayton, North Carolina, which is uh, near Raleigh. And um, the essay is about um, my trip to the DMV. And, um, so at the DMV, there was a little bit of confusion. Um, um, uh, do you want me to go into this, right? Yes, okay. Um, there was a, bit, a little bit of confusion. So when um, the um, when the DMV worker, she sort of uh, printed off um, uh, my information, I saw that she had checked off white for uh, race, and um, I was kind of, I figured it was just a mistake, and I said, oh, I'm not white, obviously, <laughs> and, um, but she didn't, um, but it wasn't a mistake, she had done that on purpose, because she didn't know how to classify um, Latinx people, or she said that, um, in the past, the other Latinx people that have come through have chosen white. Um, and so it was just sort of bewildering. And um, I was like, isn't there a Latinx Hispanic category? And she said, no, there was, but I think she was just confused uh, that day. Um, so, so she checked off white first and I said, no. And then I said, well, check off black then if that's, you know, if I only have these sort of like sort of American racial categories to choose from. Um, she didn't choose black uh, after I told her to. Um, she chose, instead chose other. And I said, well, you know, um, we, we had a nice conversation about the sort of uh, African diaspora and um, sort of ideas of blackness um, that aren't just you know, I sort of made my case for why I would prefer she choose black. Um, and then finally she uh, chose black and uh, that's what it says on my license, I guess. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, I remember receiving the essay and just thinking, I am so glad that someone is approaching this mm -hmm. you know, topic within a topic within a topic, um, because almost always I think mm -hmm. The South, you know, is mainly understood to be black and white, white and black. And sometimes the rhetoric fails to um, you know, recognize because the top, you know, the theme for this festival is voices. And there are voices um, not just in between, but kind of overlapping and interweaving between those two categories. And there really aren't just two categories, right? There's so many ways of being and living in the South and being a Southerner, um, whether you consider yourself as one or not. Um, so I was really excited when your essay came in because I thought, you know, the conversation wouldn't be complete among the 21 writers um, mm -hmm. without it. So thank you for that. Um, Diana, can you tell us a little bit about your connection to North Carolina? Yes. So I, um, I, I grew up here. Um, I was actually born in Virginia, but when my parents uh, divorced, um, I was about four and my mother brought me and my little sister back to the town and back to the home where she was raised, um, which is a little farm in Rougemont, North Carolina. Um, that's kind of on the Durham County, Person County, Orange County line. Um, so that's where I grew up. And uh, even as a little girl, I mean, I was a little weird bookish child 
um, and kind of just knew that I didn't want to stay in Rougemont. And I was convinced, you know, I was going to go somewhere and live in the city and that was going to be the rest of my life. And even as I got older, um, I mean, I, I knew, you know, even when I was very small that I wanted to go into medicine as well. So I just kind of assumed that that would take me somewhere and it would be somewhere far away from North Carolina, never to return. Um, at some point, um, I started kind of thinking, well, maybe it'd be nice if I came back, you know, but only when I'm an old lady and I've lived out my life and I just want to have some relaxing life um, on a, next to the pond somewhere. But the, the longer I traveled and I went to, um, uh, like I was in DC for medical school and then I went to New Orleans for a few years for training, went to Chicago for a year, for a few years for training. And the longer I was away, the more I started feeling the pull to come back, um, which I shouldn't have been surprised about because that's what like half of the people in my family do. They say that they're leaving and then they end up coming back. <laughs> When it came time for me to like get my, you know, first like big girl job after training, I was looking around and I was thinking about staying in Chicago, um, thinking about going back to New Orleans for a while too. Um, but then I came back down here and I don't know, I don't know what it is about this place, especially don't know what it is about the little town that I grew up in. But um, I came to visit my mom a few times and I just kind of felt this urge to come back and to be with my family. And in particular, one of the things that was surprising to me was that I felt the urge to try to see if I couldn't get the farm back into shape. Um, I don't know where that came from because uh, teenage Diana was definitely not about farm life. Um, so I ended up um, looking for jobs you know, pretty late in the whole process. And, you know, went around to a few different places. I had a couple of offers and then this job, I, I was just kind of like, you know what, I'll, I'll just, I'll just send an email and see if anyone's looking and then I'll see if that actually is a sign. And as soon as I, I like sent a cold email asking if anybody was hiring um, at my particular institution now, I got, basically we had this conversation and it turned out to be exactly the job that I was looking for in the right location and everything just kind of came together. And now I'm back and I tried to not move back to Rougemont. Um, even then, like I got an apartment in Durham, um, but I find myself uh, now I'm trying to just like, as soon as I get my life together, I guess carve out this little place on my family's land where I can put a little house and be here, I guess. That's so, I mean, for lack of a better word, idyllic. Um, also, the power of an email. How, the most dangerous thing is the email, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Many an email has, like, changed people's lives without <laughs> even knowing it was going to happen. Um, but what I also really love about your essay is that there's such a, a sense of, like, wind-like movement in your work. Um, and almost, like, this dream sense of, like, this swirl of breath. And when I teach your essay in my classes, actually, it's a perfect way for me to talk about breath and prose. Um, not just breath in like, you know, characters actually breathing, but the work actually breathing um, through the words and in the spaces in between. And in fact, that's the reason why I, I arranged the anthology the way I did. Um, so the anthology ends with your essay, and I'm um, Diana. And, it just felt right to leave the reader with the inhale and the exhale that your essay does throughout. And to me, that's what it meant to make a piece of writing come alive. Like the, the, whole, the whole thing already had its pulse, you know, from beginning to end, from like writer one through writer 21. And, you know, it definitely, I definitely wanted the reader to flip that last page, close the book, feeling like they've encountered something living. Um, and that's definitely so true about both of your works and something that I've, you know, it's a comment that I've received a lot um, from editors and reviewers, from, you know, audience members, readers, and that to me is so powerful because 
Yeah, that's what we do. That's what we do is like to bring things to life. Um, but that said, um, this living anthology we put together, much like you know this festival we're in, the Greensboro Bound Festival, it's intended to celebrate and highlight people and voices in the South. And apart from voice, um, much of the focus of the 21 essays in the anthology was also building a sense of place um, while Diana's place for the most part was the vastness of academia and this migration back to the family farm um, that just has this like gravitational pull. Elise wrote about an experience at a rather small and magnified mundane place like the DMV, kind of where like something mundane and extraordinary like interact with each other. Um, so I was wondering for audience members who might be students of the craft, um, might be beginning writers, do you have any advice to them on how to create a sense of place on the page? What tools do you to draw from your toolbox? And perhaps how do you bring forth voices from these places that you build on the page? Um, when I'm creating a setting, um, I spend a lot of time with my eyes closed and um, I say, um, especially so the first go around might not be sufficient. Um, the reader may not be able to see the setting in its totality. And so that's why I spend a lot of time with my eyes closed, just sort of visualizing it and um, thinking about what's in the space and sort of moving around in the space. One of the things that um, I teach my students is that with setting, you want to create a setting that also um, helps evoke character. And so, um, you know, in the DMV, I'm, if I were gonna describe something in the DMV, I would describe something that um, somehow connects to character or the character of the DMV worker, et cetera. So, you know, you're making choices about what you're highlighting in that particular space. Um, and then with the voices, it's, it's really the same process. One of the more difficult things I think in writing is writing good dialogue. And so for me, it's a process of like whittling um, where um, I will always try to just sort of expunge whatever it is I'm thinking on the page. And um, so I'll just put um, all the sort of verbiage on the page first. And then what, what I go and do, again, I'm going to sit there with my eyes closed and I'm going to try to listen to those um, characters. I'm going to try to imagine how they talk, what word choices they would use, um, the rhythm of their sentences, etc. And so when I go do that, then, you know, I'm editing the dialogue and I'm taking out that word. Um, I'm thinking about, am I losing the character at this moment? If so, I will, you know, add a gesture. Um, gesture. I will add an internal thought, et cetera. Um, but that is, you know, and then I will read it out loud to myself. Because again, one of the things with dialogue is that you don't want to sound, um, you don't want the voices to sound unreal. You want them to sound as real as, as possible on the page. And so again, it's, it's, um, it's the visualizing and then it's the talking to myself um, to really get into, um, get those voices right. I'm so glad that you said that because I <laughs> taught a class last night to Kohaley actually and I, our warm up exercises, I had everyone, they were comfortable, you know, leave their cameras on, it was a Zoom class. Mm -hmm. um, if they wanted to turn their cameras off, they could. And I had them all close their eyes mm -hmm. and I had to visualize um, the place they were writing about. And I had them visualize like water around this place. Like what are the bodies of water in this place? Because, you know, some things that are really everyday to us, those are the mm -hmm. that matter, right? Those, that's the stuff of life mm -hmm. um, that you neglect or forget just going through your day. But I'm glad that you also like to close your eyes and visualize. <laughs> yes. And you're not going to go ghost on the walks and just like, <laughs> but I do a lot of that. Um, Diana, what about you? What other um, quirks do you, <laughs> do you have? <laughs> 
Um, I guess when I think um, about place and particularly in my writing, I think about it and or I kind of come from this uh, perspective where the places where I tend to be and I tend to write a lot of creative nonfiction are places that not a lot of people know the inner workings of, I guess. Like you can drive past a farm, you can see a field, maybe you recognize what that looks like and you can kind of understand um, how it looks from the bird's eye view perspective. Um, but I want my readers, if I'm, if I'm writing about farming things, I want you to be there in the field with me, 93 degrees, 87% humidity, all these clothes on your body and you're just miserable. So it's like, yes, you are in this beautiful place, but also I want you to be there to see me sweating, to see just the nastiness of the bugs and the flies and the stickiness of the dirt on your hand, it's disgusting. So if I'm thinking about that, and then even also, I also do a lot of writing about medicine since that's you know my other, my, my other job. Um, and a lot of people might have, you know, a familiarity with a doctor's office or with what the inside of a hospital looks like. Um, but, you know, I've had to get used to, especially when I was in training, you're in the hospital 80, 90, 100, 120 hours a week. And you get to see like what the hospital looks like at 3 at 3 a.m., where the best places to hide are, where it doesn't maybe smell quite as bad, <laughs> like maybe where you can go and you can sit in front of a window and you can see the outline of the city. So I want you to kind of, again, and even then, like what it feels like to wear the same scrubs for 38 hours and you haven't taken a shower or brushed your teeth or something. Again, I want you to be able to see like the prettiness that's around you, the, film, the familiarity that you might have with these different places just from seeing them as like someone who's looking from the outside. But I also want the, the reader to be in there with me in the moment. So I try to make my just background description as detailed as possible to make it as vivid as possible and try to really just engage as many of the senses as I can um, I like to, um, I won't say I close my eyes. I will say I read to myself a lot and um, just kind of sit, look at what I've read or look at what I've written and just read it out loud over and over again to see if I feel like I'm, especially like if I'm working, there's a rhythm to the work that you're doing. There's just a kind of a cadence that you go through. Um, and that's whether you're in the field or you're in, the office and you're working with a patient. So as I'm reading these things out loud, I'm trying to make sure that I'm kind of going through the same rhythms um, that I would be if I was out there, whichever place I'm in, doing the same kind of a work. I'm so glad also that you talk about rhythm. Um, that's you know, in, in my classes, no matter what level I'm teaching, I like to tell people that like, there's this one thing I'm gonna keep talking about. And it's like, if you're a dancer, you know, you do your plies, whether you're a beginning ballerina or you're like prima ballerina, you go to the bar and you do your plies every day to get stronger. And for me, that plie is like this acronym that I learned in an art high school I went to, like an art public school that I went to, you know, when I was a teenager. And the very first day, I remember the art teacher walked in and said, my name's Ruby, R-U-B-E. And that's all you need to know about me. That's all you need to know about this class. And she's like, R-U-B-E stands for rhythm, unity, balance, emphasis. And I think both of what you guys were talking about with rhythm and movement and cadence, right? That's like the rhythm part, um, whether that's um, uh, vernacular or song or movement, repetition, ritual, um, or a refrain maybe that pops up throughout. Um, the prose or unity, there's something that um, drives all the forces together, kind of there's this main intention um, that is revealed throughout, or maybe it's revealed immediately, and then we kind of um, actually draw back um, as we progress. And then with balance, you were saying, Diana, with, yeah, here's the pretty stuff, here's all the beauty, here's all the idyllic. Um, images, but then here's also me unshowered at 3 a.m. and still in my scrubs because those opposing forces 
again, like kind of bring the tension and, and again, that's, that's real life, right? That's what we recognize as real. That's the stuff of life. And then emphasis is just, what is that kind of turn that we don't expect the, the turn or that, that image that like, we somehow wanted to be there and somehow it magically appeared. Um, it's like whatever the psyche was longing for and it happened. Um, but yeah, so you both are so great at, at building these worlds and, and again, bringing forth voices. And while we're on the topic of voices, I was wondering if there were any writers or works from the region um, or from other writers of color that you turn to for inspiration or leisure or practice? Um, can you share, share some titles? So uh, one of the uh, books that um, I love um, is Sabrina and Karina by Kali Fajardo and Stein. Uh, she's my friend, but um, it's an ideal book for me because I just reread it. Yes. <laughs> I just reread it with my class. And um, one of the things that struck me was I felt like I was reading it for the first time. And um, which I think speaks to this idea that um, you're finding new things in the writing every time you go back to it. And so it's like a little treasure trove. Um, and I felt that way with um, some of the books by Toni Morrison, um, where it's it's a book where again you go back to it over and over again and you're going to find something new and I find that pretty remarkable because it allows you to enjoy the book um, multiple times and uh, one of the other books that I, uh, short story collections that I love is Drowned by Juno Diaz and um, I reread it with my class also and um, you know it's um, he has these lines that just sort of hit you um, and those are the things that I'm looking for when I'm writing. Like I want to be able to convey or have lines in my work that the reader can um, sort of take with them and sort of use as a bomb on their heart when they're hurt and what have you. Just like some of the lines from Beloved that I still remember um, that I can call upon, you know, at a certain moment of time. And so that's that kind of writing um, that I want to do. And so the writers that I love the most are the ones that, you know, uh, sort of are in line with the things that um, I want to do. Um, I'm very interested in endings that um, really sort of, um, you know, are the pinnacle of that um, narrative arc um, where there was an epiphany at the end. I really hate flat endings. So I feel like uh, an ending can either make or break a story. So you can have a great story, but if the ending's flat, sort of, it's, it's, defl it's a deflating moment. Um, so those are, um, you know, two of the collections that I love the most. Um, I also love The Museum of Innocence by Orhan Pamuk. And it's a book that um, shouldn't work. It's a 600 page novel. And it's really about the main character who basically is obsessed over this woman. And it's really about that obsession. And there are many scenes where he's just at the dinner table with the, with the family. And again, it shouldn't, somehow it does. and. Um, it's a book that, you know, you'll underline certain lines. Um, it's a book that's really um, invested in reality um, in the sense, you know, I'm not going to write about, you know, a serial killer or anything like that, even though I think that would be terribly fun. But I don't have that, you know, sort of knowledge. But I'm writing um, realism. Um, I'm writing those real, you know, just everyday things. And so how do you make that exciting? How do you make that intriguing? And so I don't know how Orhan Pamuk did it, but somehow he got us through the 600 page novel that's about the same thing, but it was just beautifully rendered. And um, so, yeah, so that's some of what I love and what I look for when I'm reading. Diana? Um, yes, I, I mean, I completely agree with Toni Morrison. I feel like I can just read 
read her works over and over, pick up something new every time. Every time I think, oh, I don't necessarily feel like I need to read this book again. Like I, I have a bunch on my bookshelf. I'll just look at the book and say, okay, well, I guess maybe this is what I do need today. Um, just to reread and see if I can't pick something else up. Um, other other authors that I seem to read consistently over and over and again, um, Ocean Vuong's, uh, particularly um, um, Night, Night Sky with Exit Wounds. I think I totally just botched that title. Um, I, I like to think that I have poetry within me, but I am also recognize I am horrible at writing poetry. So I just love it when I can just see um, the imagery that uh, he's able to put together and just the way that the sentences are constructed, it's just beautiful. I also have a soft spot in my heart for um, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous. Uh, I think uh, mostly because of some of the farming scenes that are in there and I could feel, um, again, felt like I was in that place with uh, the characters and the narrator during um, certain scenes and just the way that it was constructed. I love the idea of kind of juxtaposing beautiful, idyllic, farmy kinds of settings with the ugliness that is in the work that you're doing and the just the physicality of it. And if you can kind of put those things together and present it in a really beautiful way um, with really lovely, just lovely ways that they constructed the sentences, I, I just, I'm all about it. Um, I um, have been reading a lot of, it just seems like every time springtime rolls around, I start reading, wanting to read a bunch of poetry. So I've been turning to Jericho Brown's work a lot lately as well. I love um, with, with his poems in particular that I feel like I need to catch my breath after I've read them or just kind of sit and pause and wait a minute. And sometimes it's even to the point where like I'll read um, a poem of his and just feel like I have to kind of put the book down, get up, go do something else. I usually feel like I need to do something outside for whatever reason. And then I can kind of come back after I process it and sat in the moment um, and just kind of given the poem space to breathe. Um, other, other authors that I particularly like, I love it when I have um, a book that makes me, not necessarily makes me feel something, but makes me feel something like on a visceral level. And I think about Jasmine Board and her novels that I just, there have been so many times I've read them, particularly um, A Sing Unburied Sing, and I wanted to throw the book across the room. And I know that if I'm having like that kind of reaction, I'm like, okay, I'm really invested in this story because it's, it's making me so angry and conflicted at the same time. I love how she is able to focus on family um, and just really describe like the nuance in the, the relationships between different family members and being able to see how those relationships work within the bigger context of a family, um, particularly a family in, in the South. And even though it's, you know, a different kind of South than I grew up in, um, you can just see how there's so many different things that you can kind of relate to and connect with. So I, I feel like those are some of the ones, but again, I probably could just go through my bookshelf and be like, yep, I've read this like 10 times. I read this 20 times. And I, I just keep seeming to come back to those in particular. Thank you. I know, I know, I knew that um, when I had planned on asking that question, um, I knew that it, you know, it, it's a joy to talk about the books we love as writers, but also it's a little painful to, to okay, let's narrow it down. But um, I think both of you gave really great examples of, um, for me specifically, like, like you said, feeling something or feeling like you're in that place with a character or um, fe feeling the nuance of relationships um, interactions between human beings, um, especially when we've all mostly spent time indoors the past year, um, being, having the gift that our books to remember what it's like to be near someone or um, to be in the thick of an argument or um, in the thick of a loving but heated conversation, you know, um, that's, that's, um, 
really kept my my face buried in books this past year. Um, but speaking of books um, in which my faith has been buried in, <laughs> um, it really is your very much acclaimed short story collection, Love War Story. Um, Angie Cruz described it as a short story collection that arrests the heart with its stunning ex exploration of women who are put through a kind of hell in their determination to find true love. Hilarious at times, even in the midst of the tragic and heartbreaking, love war stories is extraordinary. Punto y final. Now, um, you know, back to the topic of voices and um, just a little bit on craft. The women and girls in um, your debut collection were almost all at the cusp of romance or um, at some points more tragic than others. Um, for our audience, today who might be um, beginning writers or emerging writers, can you tell them why it was crucial for you to write about characters who were at the cusp of something? Why it was um, important to you to have, you know, to write fiction in which the characters were at a turning, turning point or at just arm's reach from something um, they desire that desires them? Sure. Um, and this is a conversation I've been having with my graduate students or the students I have um, from writing centers. And it's just really this idea that your character has to want something, right? And that desire is meant to pull them through the story. And so, you know, the desire will be met, the desire will be thwarted, or um, only the desire will only be like partially fulfilled. And so, what we want to read about, we don't, um, you know, something has to happen in the story. Um, and in the story, uh, there's gonna be complication, there's gonna be messiness, et cetera. But it's really, um, all of that is really predicated on what the character wants. And so a lot of them, a lot of the characters or almost all of them um, in, in my book, um, we, you know, want love. Um, and um, they all end up in sort of um, learning different things about love. Um, and I think most of them are thwarted in love, but they learn different things. So the stories aren't all the same. Um, but, you know, it, it's, you're answering questions, I think, when you're writing up. Uh, um, or at least it's helpful for me, you know, question do I want to answer, um, or what things have I had as an author that I want to um, sort of articulate in the, in the book, and so um, those then, um, those musings or ruminations or what have you are then put into the lives of these characters, and so then let's see what these characters are going to do um, with those ideas and thoughts and, you know, how are they going to run with them and where are they going to end up? And so, um, you know, one of the things I've been telling my students again is, you know, the conflict has to be like, you know, if it's a 20 page story, the conflict should be in like page two. Uh, and so I read, uh, you know, as I'm giving them feedback, I'm like, where's the conflict? Because, um, and the conflict should be early because, you know, you shouldn't have somebody reading a story um, and we're five, six pages in and we don't know what the story is about. Um, and so these are just, these are basic principles that I think people often forget when they actually start writing. And so that's why it's good for me to actually teach and remember these things. And I, as a writer, can then go back to it and be like, oh yeah, duh, I forgot this myself, you know? Um, so anyways, so desire, you know, that's really the heart of the story, which is what Um, um, it's funny because I've been taking down notes as you've been talking because like you said, like teaching is the best way to learn, right? And I'm working on like a narrative nonfiction um, book right now and trying to employ uh, all the fiction tools I know to reportage. And as I'm also teaching a class, I'm remembering things that I need to put into my work. And... Yeah, I think it makes you a better writer to 
to share what you know and to yeah it's just it's good to remember um mm -hmm. but talking about you know teaching or guiding um I have a question for Diana actually um since you're the only southern born of us um three here I was wondering if you could spearhead your own anthology of essays about the south um what central theme or topic or or object or whatever it is or motif um would you kind of rally writers their essays around i think i um i i would like to maybe explore a little bit more about um just the rural South, I feel, and particularly the rural South that you're not seeing like on television. Um, I feel like I have a lot of things that I could say about the, the previous elections and cycles, but every time they talk about like rural voters, they talk about um, basically not me, not my family, not people that live in the place where I grew up. Um, I, I think that, you know, something, when I say that I grew up on a farm, I'm not exactly who most people are expecting to see when they talk about like farming, farm life. Um, but I'm like, I mean, and I recognize, you know, there are, I think I saw something that said it was about 2% of farmers are black. Um, they, I didn't really see as much about Latinos, but you know, we're, we're here too. Um, but people don't tend to think about rural South, agrarian South, farming, any of that kind of thing. And think about it being people of color, um, despite the fact that we're here, um, and it's not just in North Carolina. I've met other farming kids who are out there and just living kind of farming lives. Um, I actually had a conversation with someone who, um, uh, one of my colleagues is from Texas and he was talking about like how he was basically growing up in cowboy culture. And this is again, a young Latino uh, man. And again, people are like, oh, well that's, you know, that's weird. And it's like, no, they're the originators. It's just, you need to actually tell the authentic stories. So if we're going to think about like a collection of essays from the South, I'd say like, let's go get those stories. Let's talk to the people in Appalachia. Let's talk to the people who are, you know, on the coast of like South Carolina, you can talk to like the Gullah and QT people, like let's get these stories out there and show that it's not just, I don't know, some guy named Cody in like a Ford pickup with like a lift kit. Like, I'm sure, I mean, some of my cousins actually have like boards with a lift kit, but we're here, we're out there, like, let's tell more colorful stories about the South. Um, and then, of course, I mean, I would, I would love to see just other talk about like how the South is just like a vibrant, exciting place. You wouldn't think so to hear the stories about it, but there are people here that are living just really fascinating lives. Um, so when you get on that, I would like to put in my application as assistant. <laughs> I hope um, a bunch of press people are listening to this right now because they need to jump on this. But I, I agree, like one of um, one, an acquaintance I've made over um, Instagram and Zoom, you know, during the pandemic is Benny Starr, who um, writes hip hop music and is from the low country and also is from a farming family here in the low country in the Charleston area. And again, like it's his stories that you won't think of when you say Charleston, you know, people think like mint julep and horse carriage and like Rainbow Row. But in fact, like the low country is very much rural. It's very much agrarian. It's a different kind of coastal than what you might see in like, you know, coastal travel magazine. And there definitely is a way of life that um, is fighting to sustain itself. Like I think just today I saw um, Benny post something about like just land rights for black farmers, mm -hmm. um, um, that there's some development there that they've been fighting for for a while. And I know that he's really into um, writing work and just, you know, being in the fight for just access to, to clean water um, for rural families um, in South Carolina. So that, those are the sorts I'm like, come on, like we've already had too many stories about mint julep and, you know, 
that your favorite barbecue place. Like, let's, let's have this, you know, that, that was the impetus for a measure of belonging, but I hope you pursue that and I will gladly be your, um, kitty cat herder if you <laughs> need one, um, but anthology, um, editing is definitely like herding cats. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, it's just a very, very sweet cat. Um, and I will say, <laughs> cats that you will dearly love. Um, but while we're talking about places and people, I also wanted to, this just actually came to me. I read this today um, on someone's Instagram, and it's an interview with um, the poet and professor Danica Kelly um, for the Creative Independent. And they said, um, you know, the question that's, that's about like, why do you do your work? Why do you write? And um, they answered, I'm very interested in prioritizing my own comfort and my own interest. It can be helpful for young writers to consider that and to investigate with curiosity what their interests are so that they can prioritize them. What feels good? What's going to feel exciting to read later? I love reading my own work. I wish people would talk about their writing practices with more of that joy. I just know people love their own work because why else would they do it? No one's like, I need your poems. Nobody's ever said that. There must be some internal joy and excitement and you just tap into it and are connected to it. Um, that was, to borrow um, Ivelisse's words, a balm for me today. Um, trying to work through you know, many different projects, some writing, some teaching, some editing, um, and the many other um, publishing tasks that come um, with a job. And uh, I thought, why am I in this? And I'm in this because I really do, like that sounds so narcissistic, but I really do. And I think this applies to you both. When, I, when I've written that line that I'm so proud of, like I really see myself there and I see the reader joining me there in that moment. That really is a joyful um, thing for me. And I reread my work, you know, in private. Um, sometimes I read it uh, and force it upon the people I share <laughs> my <laughs> space with, my daughter and my husband. And just at the dinner table, we'll read something that you know, either has already been published or something new, but I think there is very much a joy that we neglect to talk about um, often, um, but I wanted to see and tap into that joy and see if you two could read a little bit, maybe a short passage from your essays um, that, that, that you're just really joyful about. I'll just read the beginning. Um, which I think um, where I try to capture um, the event with a little bit of humor. <laughs> um, oh, wait, I'm not white. I said partially amused. After all, I was stating the obvious to the woman at the DMV who had me verify my license and voter registration information. Isn't there a Hispanic Latino category, I asked, even though that seemed like a, another silly thing to say. I mean, there had to be a Hispanic Latino person of Cuban, Mexican, Puerto Rican, South or Central American, or other Spanish cultural origin, regardless of race, box to check off. No, she said. No? No, she reaffirmed. My mother had gone to the DMV the day before in Clayton, North Carolina, and hadn't mentioned this racial ethnic conundrum. And partly due to my exaggerated stereotypes of the South, I believed the woman at the DMV and thought, well, this is the South. Wait, so what do the other Latinos pick, I asked, genuinely curious. She leaned forward and said in a hushed conspiratorial tone, they usually pick white. What? Really? I was stunned and perplexed by this admission. In terms of Latinos in North Carolina, they are mostly Mexican or Mexican-American, and not the blue-eyed, blonde-haired Mexicans of telenovelas, so definitely not white, but not Black either. I assumed she marked white by accident, but she had checked it off on purpose based on past experience. 
Yet I was still curious as to why she defaulted to white versus black when she looked at me. I had grown up my whole life with the sensibility that I am a dark-skinned Puerto Rican. Where I grew up in Holyoke, Massachusetts, that was one of two identifiers for Puerto Ricans. The other one was light-skinned. And no Puerto Rican would ever call me the latter. And I'll just stop there. Thank you so much, Vinny. Diana? Sure, I think I'll, I'll just read the beginning of mine as well. Um, it sticks to everything. Stains your skin, cakes under your nails, or it makes them crack or tear or bleed. Cleaning yourself hardly helps. You scrub long enough and the grime might wash away, but the odor lingers. Sun ripened raspberry and honey vanilla soaps can't quite cover it up. It stays with you. A year might go by, a decade. You get caught up in a cloud of cigarette smoke one day and you inhale and there it is. Motor oil and tractor exhaust. The sun beating down on red clay fields. You in rubber boots, thick pants and a hat. Sweating, swearing, standing among rows and rows of tobacco. The brown gum covering its yellow green leaves. The brown gum smeared all over your hands. I still smell it in my sleep. Every spring, summer, and fall, from my sixth birthday to the day that I packed up and left for college revolved around tobacco. It was the same for my mother and hers and hers. My family could mark the passage of time by matching it to the growing cycle. I lost my first tooth shortly after my grandfather sowed seeds into frost-kissed earth. I got my first period the evening after a morning spent on the planter, the rusted metal seat staining my clothes. Every cycle was the same. I got up, got dressed, went to school, came back, went to the fields, wished for winter to come. Every day was the same. The only thing that got me out of the fields, aside from the period, was schoolwork. My grandmother worked as a teacher's aide when she wasn't working on the farm. She expected excellence. Sometimes I'd bring my book to the fields. I'd work through math problems while sitting in my grandfather's rickety pickup truck, switch with my sister when it was my turn to prime the leaves and her turn to do worksheets. Sometimes I turned in papers that were sprinkled with dusty red clay. I live on a tobacco farm, I'd say, if anybody asked. Their eyebrows would lift a little. They always looked surprised. Little black girls don't live on farms anymore, I guess. It's algebra too, I'd say, if anybody asked. For some reason, the looks that I got were the same. Thank you so much to you two um, for that wonderful reading. And I can't wait to replay those two clips over and over again, just for myself, just talking about rhythm and cadence and joy and just um, there's this uncertainty of um, the voice in both of your works. And I'm just so grateful for that. And it really is so inspiring for me. Um, I'm not just saying that I really have been so inspired by both of you. And whenever I think there is not enough hours in the day to get new work done, I think if Evelise and Diana can do it, I can squeeze in even the 15 minutes of writing one sentence, I can do it. Um, so I'm so thankful for you both. I hope that um, that reading and this discussion has piqued the interest of our audience members. And I'm sure it has, um, I sure hope that they pick up a copy of A Measure of Belonging and Love War Stories. And I know that they're looking forward to reading more work from both of you. Um, so thank you for being here with me again today and thank you to our audience members and thank you to Greensboro Bound for having us. Everyone take care. Thank you again for joining us for 21 Conversations. If you enjoyed this presentation, please like and share with your friends and fellow readers. One final reminder that Greensboro Bound is a nonprofit organization committed to bringing together readers and writers throughout the year at zero cost to our community. Please help Greensboro Bound maintain that commitment with a sustaining or one-time gift now. The number to text to give and our website are on your screen. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you in person next year.